thanks so much, Bevan, for that really um, generous introduction. And I'm so thrilled and delighted that you've invited me here today to mark Women's History Month. And I'm going to be talking about my fairly new project on enslaved wet nurses in the antebellum United States. Um, I'm especially pleased to be here at Nottingham. Um, I was talking to my parents about my visit today, and it turns out that my dad was one of only six people to graduate with single honours American studies in 1972. So that, that, that's going back a bit, but it's, it's nice that American studies has such a, a long history here. So my paper today, it comes out of a much broader project I'm currently working on. Can people hear me okay, by the way, at the back? Is that okay? Um, I'm working on a much broader project um, funded by the AHRC, which is looking into enslaved motherhood through a comparative perspective. So with uh, other colleagues at the universities of um, Newcastle, Warwick, and... Um, Sao Paulo in Brazil, just to make things exciting. We're actually going to be sort of tracing um, the lives of enslaved mothers, their attitudes towards their children um, through a much more Atlantic perspective, bringing together different historians through a series of different events. I think enslaved wet nursing is really important because I'm interested in this whole notion of the dual exploitation of enslaved women as workers and as reproducer and as reproducers you know, through bearing children. What's interesting about wet nursing is that it literally encapsulates this intersection of exploitation based on the ability to bear children and the exploitation of labor where women provide both their time as labourers and their milk as wet nurses to people who hold them in bondage. So wet nursing then, I think it can be situated within, if you like, um, a spectrum of exploitation. And at one end of this spectrum, we have enforced wet nursing. At the other end, we have women's paid employment as so-called professional wet nurses. And then somewhere else in, in the middle of the spectrum, we have sort of informal networks of support where women help each other by feeding each other's children and informally sharing their breast milk. And I think that there's actually very, very little evidence of this latter concept. So there have been many, many different forms of wet nursing. It's not a simple, single, simple process. It's not a single entity. It can be altruistic. For, of course, if we think about the Roman image of charity, who feeds her father, and this later, of course, is something adopted by Steinbeck in The Grapes of Wrath. Wet nursing can also be highly exploitative, and to give another example from American fiction, because I'm aware of my audience, think, of course, of Seth in Toni Morrison's Beloved and the theft of her own breast milk by others. By thinking about wet nursing then historically, putting it within broader, long-run contexts of mother's exploitation across time and across space under a variety of different regimes, I think we can illuminate quite a lot about different power structures and different forms of exploitation directed against women. Another thing I find interesting about wet nursing, of course, is that it's self-fulfilling. So when a woman gives her baby to another female to feed, or else uses artificial methods um, to feed her children, her own milk supply then diminishes and she then finds it harder to breastfeed in the future. And it's these simple biological facts, it's something sometimes maybe we don't talk about enough in relation to, women, relation to women's history. These biological facts, they influence women's decision to use or to serve as wet nurses in the past. The praxis then, I think it enlightens debate about the processes and understandings of motherhood, especially when we're talking about groups such as enslaved women who've been relatively neglected in more traditional historical analyses. Wet nursing, too, is simply a practical response by women who want children to survive. If we don't have wet nurses sometimes, then children simply die. And um, the foremost historian of wet nursing in these broader contexts is Valerie Fielders. And she's written that wet nursing is an ancient, ingrained and widely accepted social custom. But Fielders doesn't have a lot to say about black women. As we know, black women have endured many racist assumptions about their ability to reproduce, 
their ability to breastfeed and their ability to labour. And Jennifer Morgan wrote how colonial travellers to West Africa typically commented on African women's breasts. Typically they saw them as being very large, very long. They enabled women to suckle, as she says, over their shoulders. Ultimately, these travellers' beliefs in black women's alleged easy breastfeeding and easy childbirth laid the foundations for exploitation under slavery, ideas about African women's alleged superior ability to perform hard manual labour and to bear and raise children at the same time. So what I want to do today is firstly I'm going to talk about some of the difficulties faced by historians, foolish historians such as myself who are interested in researching this topic. I'm then briefly going to consider wet nursing through a fairly long run historical perspective um, and talk about how the practice had declined by the early 20th century. I also want then to think about wet nursing more theoretically, to think about it within the ideological concept of motherhood, including the social construct of mammy, very important when it comes to studying US slavery, and thinking about sort of stereotypical image of maternal black mothers. Finally, I'm going to actually get round to thinking about some primary evidence for exploring wet nursing in the antebellum South, framing the practice within these broader discourses of both gendered and racial exploitation. Um, and then I'm going to conclude by talking about um, some of the, what I see as the more contemporary significances of historic wet nursing practices. So there are four very uneven parts to today's talk um, and apologies for that. Okay, so firstly then, um, as I found out, wet nursing is a very difficult topic to research. Considering its, use, its unique significance, I find this surprising, but there are considerable methodological issues when it comes to looking at sources for exploring wet nursing. Based upon extensive um, research, mostly focusing on white women's testimony, letters, diaries and journals, supplemented with some Works Progress Administration or WPA interviews, a historian called um, Sally Macmillan concluded that, what she says, only around one fifth of white Southern women relied on female domestic slaves as white nurses in the antebellum South. My research, in contrast, it's not framed quantitatively, and I don't question her claim that only one-fifth of white Southern women used a wet nurse. But I do think that it can be read in more absolute terms. And while historians have unsurprisingly disagreed about the number of slaveholders in the antebellum South, if we take for an example an approximate figure of about 350,000 slaveholders in 1850 as a benchmark, if we then assume that these had wives, of whom one-fifth used a wet nurse, this still suggests a total of some 70,000 wet nurses across the antebellum South. So importantly then, this isn't an insignificant number. And then moving on to the methodological difficulties in attempting to research wet nursing. Um, those who describe their experiences of slavery, whether black or white, they frequently fail to distinguish between a nurse, as in someone who cares for children, and a wet nurse who suckles children. People use both terms interchangeably, as they had done since ancient times. And I think um, these comments from Louisa Piquet, they show quite sort of firmly, really, how, you know, how we can run into problems when we're trying to sort of actually quantify or to measure who's a nurse and who's a wet nurse. In the USA, wet nursing remained for many, ultimately a very private experience involving two women and a baby. It's simply not recorded in any way. And as historian Janet Golden has written, sometimes it's simply an untraceable interaction. Moving on to WPA evidence, um, upon which I've relied quite heavily for this project, um, a search through the full 41 volumes of George P. Roick's American Slave, including the supplementary volumes, which you have to go through by hand, so it takes forever, yielded only 50 explicit references to wet nursing by black or white women in the antebellum South. 
But of course, it's true that many of the respondents simply didn't consider this topic worthy or appropriate of comment. Some women may simply have wet nursed while they were performing additional chores elsewhere, which they considered more important. They simply failed to mention it. Other respondents, of course, who were very young when they're interviewed, didn't necessarily, they weren't necessarily aware of the work of older women in this realm. So again, they simply failed to mention wet nursing. So I think it's important that the WPA evidence necessarily underestimates the extent of enslaved wet nursing, but I think that a, very, a fairly close textual analysis of the respondents' comments about the practice do shed quite a lot of light on its nature and its significance for enslaved women. So I think it's important that rather than attempting to measure wet nursing, where I can say emphatically that I failed to do so, it's much more important to consider it in different ways. Consider it in terms of of a place, a site of exploitation for women within the broader context of slave regimes. Okay, so moving on to a long run perspective about wet nursing then. The practice across time and space has commonly involved women in very unequal power relationships. For example, in ancient Greece and Rome, I never thought I'd be researching this, but many slave women in these regimes served as wet nurses, some of whom then used their role as wet nurses to successfully acquire their freedom. And this point has some resonances with enslaved wet nurses of the antebellum South, as well as those in Brazil and Cuba, as I'll come on to later. Research on wet nursing in some Islamic societies has shown how this sense of milk <coughs> kinship between a wet nurse, the children she feeds, and her own children creates bonds so strong that any future relationship between them would be considered incest. So it's a real taboo in some societies. In France, the practice of wet nursing is very common and also, luckily for historians, fairly well documented from the 12th century onwards. And by the pre-revolutionary era, there are various financial incentives offered to women to wet nurse. This sometimes resulted in women sacrificing the health of their own children. Likewise, in pre-industrial England, wealthy women tended to employ wet nurses from lower down the social scale. And what's important for our context, I think, is that women then replicated these feeding patterns in colonial North America, using both enslaved and white wet nurses to feed their infants. Obviously, this makes sound economic sense for slaveholders. Paying for the services of a wet nurse is unnecessary when one could be procured for free from one's own slaves. But as noted by historian Paula Treckel, colonial American women also faced considerable pressures, especially from puritanical reformers who commonly castigated mothers who employed wet nurses, regarding them as vain and sinful in nature. So by the 19th century, a growing number of professionalized medical practitioners in the USA, this is at a time, of course, when the medical profession is growing, they increasingly advocated, as they do to the present day, that, quote, breast is best, unless under specific circumstances, such as illness <coughs> or an inability to produce milk. For example, a so-called professor of hygiene at City University of New York suggested in 1839 that women should only use wet nurses if the summer heat made their milk unhealthy. He was also concerned about wet nurses who might come from, quote, undesirable backgrounds, about wet nurses having a healthy diet and being able to provide optimum nutrition for infants. So professional guidelines such as these then growing professional guidelines exemplify a real growing hostility towards wet nurses within medical discourses over the course of the 19th century. And in some ways, this simply reflects a, a social class divide. Janet Golden argues that wet nursing very much evolved into an occupation for stigmatized and poor single mothers. But Golden's talking really about the urban and northern United States. And in the South, I think, slavery shaped attitudes towards infant feeding in very different ways. 
So, for example, in the north, there's rising concerns about so-called unscrupulous wet nurses, for example, giving infants uh, or opium tincture to make them drowsy, to help them sleep. But this simply doesn't apply in the South, where enslaved women are unlikely to have access to this sort of medication. White Southerners also seem to reject ideas that wet nursing would imbue infants with certain racial characteristics, a viewpoint gain, increasingly gaining credence in the North. And for example, in 1825, a South Carolina physician called George Logan brushed aside claims that infant milk shaped a person's character as, quote, heathenish superstition. 19th century medical professionals also highlighted dangers of artificial infant feeding, which, of course, until the advent of modern techniques of sterilization, frequently caused ill health and death among infants. Breast milk's natural immunities are absent in animal milk, and nor were people fully aware of issues of black bacteria and the importance of sanitation. Keeping milk warm is difficult in hot summers. But despite these dangers, Valerie Fieldes has explained how women in the past, again across time and space, have used many different forms of artificial feeding, not always well documented. For example, feeding cow's milk or goat's milk from horns or spoons, whereas other women fed their babies um, a mixture of sugar and bread wrapped in a piece of cloth which their infants would um, suck. And it's only really by the beginning of the 20th century that mother's use of bottled and formula, formula milk becomes widespread. In the antebellum south, mothers rarely fed their infants with bottles, instead relying on the continuing availability of enslaved wet nurses. And I put a longer quote here from Giles Smith on the slide. He reveals how he's only bottle fed because there was no enslaved wet nurse to feed him after he was gifted away from his mother while an infant. And in a broader context too, I think it's important that broader ideological as well as medical developments play a role in wet nursing's decline over the course of the 19th century. Enlightenment ideas about what it meant to be a good mother encouraged so-called natural methods of infant nutrition and care that included feeding one's own children. Indeed, European writers of the 18th century onwards increasingly celebrated notions of female domesticity and that it's women's duty to breastfield. So there's very much a new rhetoric of <coughs> sentimental maternalism that celebrated maternal love and encouraged breastfeeding while discourses on motherhood increasingly celebrated this notion of modern maternity and bourgeois domesticity as necessarily noble and self-sacrificial. And of course, these are words which would no doubt appeal to many women struggling with the endless night feeds. So new publications then suggested that the care and nurture of children was a profession about which women should keep themselves informed. Gender tropes about feminine care and nurture developed into a whole plethora of maternalist discourses directed towards and about mothers who were increasingly deemed exclusively responsible for the physical development and moral education of their children. So the 19th century's idealization of motherhood was about far more than the structural changes we all know about with the separation of men's work from the home. And of course, what's also important is that these are changes that don't directly affect enslaved women anyway, because they lived under a different set of unique relationships with different power structures. Third part, motherhood and mammy. One of the problems, as I see it, with using these fairly broad, sweeping interpretations to explain wet nursing's decline is that very few studies speak specifically to the concerns of black women, either enslaved or free, in terms of their motherhood, or more specifically, their feeding practices. Historian Katie Simpson Smith has argued for a very distinctive form of what she calls Southern motherhood for black and Native American women that wasn't confined to a more private sphere. She argues that enslaved mothers strove, out, strove to carve out a modicum of power through their more public roles as providers, teachers, spiritual guides, and protectors, even as they simultaneously suffered under bondage. 
Yet Patricia Hill Collins reminds us that it's dangerous for writers to glorify black motherhood, to celebrate and to stereotype strong black women who nevertheless put everyone else's concerns always above their own. So black motherhood remains a very contentious issue, but I think exploring black motherhood under slavery, specifically through this context of wet nursing, can shed some light on the contestations and struggle over what motherhood meant and how it was practiced. Evelyn Nakano Glenn argues that motherhood is, quote, a culturally variable relationship in which one individual nurtures and cares for another. In the US, she argues, an idealized model of motherhood based upon a white middle-class notion that mothering responsibility rests squarely with biological mothers has been projected as universal. But then excluded from this dominant ideology of private domestic motherhood, African-American women have instead practiced forms of shared motherhood, mothering. For example, by sharing caring for kin and infants, by sharing breast milk, regardless of whether one is a biological mother or not. So exploring these issues of motherhood inevitably leads one, when we're talking about slavery, to think about this mammy figure. Because mammies and wet nurses sometimes, but not always, overlapped. Mammy, of course, is a restrictive and controlling stereotype of black womanhood, the polar opposite of that other famous slave stereotype, Jezebel. And Mammy represents everything that's good and positive about slavery. She's allegedly, of course, loyal, devoted to her white family. She's asexual. She puts all her energies into supporting the white people who hold her of her in bondage. Mammy became very much revered during the Lost Cause era of the postbellum South, when many white authors romanticized slavery and fondly recalled the prominent role played by senior enslaved women, including white nurses, in their plantation households. At the same time, they simultaneously lost their, lament the loss of their peculiar institution, of course. And so these comments from Robert Q. Mallard are fairly typical. He's raised on a Georgian plantation, and he wrote, as a babe, I drew a part at least of my nourishment from the generous breasts, note the language, of a colored foster mother. She and her infant son always held a peculiar place in my regards. Somewhat later, this image of a black mammy sent to Nancy Astor by the artist Margaret de Shiel is also typical of the celebratory way in which whites characterize mammy. And while it might initially appear surprising that WPA respondents also contribute to a perceived correlation between Mammy and wet nurses, I think the fact that they're interviewed during the era of the Great Depression, Jim Crow segregation, is significant. The rose-tinted glasses with which some respondents recall the days of slavery has been well documented elsewhere. So WPA testimony about wet nursing as well, sometimes glorifies virtuous, pious mammy figures. And this is especially true, interestingly, when the male respondents remember their own mothers, who they often recall again in these rather self-sacrificial ways. So Moses Slaughter here says, my mother was the sweetest woman that God ever let live. She was the mother of 10 children of her own, which she nursed and tended. She was also the wet nurse of 10 Fauntleroy children of Master Joseph, and Mistress Fauntleroy. All of us children, black and white, called my mother Mama, and she never turned a deaf ear to a child. She was housekeeper for the white family and slept in a room of the Fauntleroy home, where she could care for the babies all night. This is no fun. Master Joseph and the mistress had so many friends and went about in society until they had no time to take care of their <coughs> children, but their new Mama would give them all the care they would ever need. She was a loyal slave, a Christian, always ready to help the children pray. Enslaved in Harrison County, Mississippi, Lucy Galloway's mother had not just a wet nurse, but also to look after her mistress's children entirely on her own. And perhaps being female herself, I think, Lucy described her mother's life as a wet nurse and a mammy in less glowing terms than do some of the male respondents. 
My mother and Steve was two of her best niggers. This is her, her mistress. Steve worked in the field and my mother was the wet nurse and she suckled all Miss Frances' children. They all called her Mammy. When Miss Frances' last baby was born, she lose her mind and they had to send her to the asylum. My mother had to look after the children until old Miss Hoy, Miss Frances' mother, took them to her house. So I think black women's accounts differ from those of men and I think they, to a much greater extent, veer away from this trope of racial intimacy promoted in Lost Cause reminiscences. But a correlation between mammy and wet nurses does exist because mammy sometimes breastfed white children. Mammy was not always middle-aged, unmarried, a spinster, maternal only towards whites. And her wet nursing of white children evokes really her multi multiple and arduous roles as a <coughs> wife and mother to her own family, as well as her responsibility towards white children. But Mammy was not always a wet nurse at all points in time. And I think it's important that we situate the conflation of these two images within wider post myths of the lost cause. Mammy and wet nurse also both illustrate an inherent irony of the antebellum South. Both roles strike at the heart of a contradictory racial ideology that dismissed black, black women's ability to mother, while at the very same time, white women left their young babies in enslaved women's arms to nurture and care for and sometimes to suckle. White slaveholders also separated enslaved mothers from their infant children when they were sold, swapped or gifted away, professing to believe that the effective ties between enslaved mothers and their offspring were weaker than those, for, those of whites. And it's wet nursing that allows whites to believe this. Moving on to exploring more depth wet nursing in the antebellum south, WPA testimony, especially that by women, suggests that many enslaved wet nurses were well aware of the ironies of their treatment at the hands of whites who as infants gained their early sustenance from them. Ellen Cragen recalled how when her master's son threatened her mother with physical punishment, she cried out, I'm going to kill you. These black titties suckled you and then you come out here to beat me. Enslaved women's bodies existed in a political arena, arena as places of resistance, argues Stephanie Camp. So while enslaved women might have taken much pleasure and pride in their ability to breastfeed their own children, their deployment at wet, as wet nurses for rights <coughs> relates more to their bodies as sites of exploitation and commodification that deprives infants of their own mother's milk. And I think probably because of these methodological difficulties when it comes to counting wet nurses that I highlighted earlier, um, very few historians have explored the practice in any depth. Most historians simply tend to cite Sally McMillan's findings that one fifth of white women used a wet nurse. For example, Katie Simpson Smith, Jane Turner Censor, Marie Jenkins Schwartz, all, all accept this one-fifth figure and most suggest rather broadly that most white women in the South preferred to feed their own children if they could. They only used the wet nurse if they had difficulties feeding or for example if they had a low milk supply. But more recently some historians have seemed to shift it, shifted their emphasis somewhat towards the more exploitative elements of wet nursing. They've moved away from this notion that the practice exemplified so-called racial closeness. Instead, they stress the complicity of white Southern women in the abuse of enslaved wet nurses. Wilma Dunaway has described the practice as a form of structural interference in enslaved women's feeding patterns. And writing more generally about relationships between enslaved and white women, Tavolia Glimp has convincingly attacked assumptions that black and white women of the South tended to share experiences as dual victims of gender discrimination. White women instead were co-masters who used their power to inflict horrendous acts of violence against the women they held in bondage. And forcing black women to feed white infant children represents one such form of violence. <coughs> 
And slave wet nursing has also been explored in other Atlantic slave regimes. In her comparative work on enslaved women in Havana and Rio de Janeiro, Camelia Cowling has noted that enslaved wet nursing frequently denied women the chance to feed their own children. And although wet nursing is probably less common on Caribbean islands, in her work on colonial Cuba, Sarah Franklin has argued that being a wet nurse offered enslaved women various material benefits. And this research very much resonates with that of Katie Simpson Smith. Um, both historians argue that enslaved women seemingly used wet nursing to gain status and prestige within white households as leverage for better conditions. But I think that surviving testimony from formerly enslaved people doesn't speak to these benefits at all. Some historians of US slavery have used um, advertisements for wet nursing as a means of exploring the practice. Janet Golden suggests that frequent advertisements for wet nurses, whether black or white, in the antebellum South, shows that enslaved wet nurses were not always readily available for whites. This advertisement from the Alexandria Gazette is fairly typical of the type of wet nurses, type of adverts, sorry, for wet nurses that appeared across the antebellum South. And notably, little or no reference is made to race or status. One of my PhD students is going to be exploring these advertisements in more depth this summer. So white women's use of enslaved wet nurses then, it provides evidence of both spatial closeness, but also racial distance between black and white women. For black women to breastfeed white children, often at the expense of their own child, remember, their mistress would have constantly to watch over them, probably not allowing them out of their sight. Enslaved women had few opportunities to resist this form of oppression, especially if they're unable to sneak away and feed their own children to use up their milk supplies. They might try to extract their breast milk manually to deprive white infants. But of course, this course of action was also deprived their own children. So really, I feel that there's no means of escape for enslaved white nurses. They're trapped within the confines of plantation homes and farms under the constant watchful eye of white women. Condemned to frequent childbirth like a white mistress, Mary Jones's mother endured the additional burden of feeding both her own infants and those of her mistress. And Mary explained her situation as follows. My mother was a wedding gift to my master at the time of his marriage, was given to him as a kind of nest egg to breed slaves for him. And just as soon as he carried her home, he brought a slave husband for her and children came to both families thick and fast. My mother would have a baby every time my mistress would have one. So my mother was always the wet nurse to my mistress. Enslaved women such as Mary Jones's mother, unfortunate enough to bear children at the same time as their mistresses, represented an obvious first choice for whites seeking a wet nurse, because of course they're already lactating. And other WPA respondents also described their mothers feeding black and white babies at the same time. Henry Clay Mormon's owners had a daughter named Sally, the same age as Henry himself. And he explained, both children being babies about the same age, the black mother served as a wet nurse for the white child. Sometimes both the black child and the white child were upon the black mammy's lap, which was frequently the cause of battles between the two babies. I really like this quote because Mormon has no idea the, as an infant of his inferior status and he's really, really prepared to fight for his own mother's milk. Other respondents, especially those who were enslaved on large plantations, described almost institutional styles, uh, institutional systems of infant feeding, where slaveholders were taking slave babies away from their mothers to be raised in plantation nurseries and fed by wet nurses. So this evidence really strikes at the heart of how whites exploited enslaved women's bodies to the maximum, taking away their milk for other infants, forcing them to labor elsewhere. Jephthah Choice and Clara Brim both described women on their Texan plantations who masters kept out of the field to wet nurse infants. And of course, separating mothers from their own infants subsequently made it easier for them to rationalize the way in which they parted mothers and infants because the babies are no longer reliant on their mother's milk. Some WPA respondents explained white women's use of wet nurses in terms of the convenience it provided them 
Matty Logan's mistress used the wet nurse to give her freedom to visit her friends. She was, quote, not tied to the place, not at her demanding baby's beck and call. Betty Curlett believed white women avoided feeding their own infants because they believed that it would make their breasts fall, it would make them droop. So white women's position of relative power and privilege permitted them the ability to make choices about whether or not to feed their own children. They acted as mother managers within their homes. They delegated the most taxing, the, most, the least desirable elements of motherhood to their slaves, including infant feeding. Always the outsider, Fanny Ann Kemble noted somewhat haughtily how Southern racial hierarchies fail to prevent white women from, quote, dangling their infants at the breasts of negresses. As usual, Kemble appears well aware of the many ironies of slavery for women. And wet nursing also appears in abolitionist writings because it provided a discourse of female exploitation easily adopted by anti-slavery activists seeking to appeal to contemporary tropes of feminine virtue and motherhood. Hinton Rowan Helper's impending crisis of the South described white Southern men as, quote, abandoned wretches who as infants sucked in the corrupt milk of slavery from the breasts of their father's sable concubines. Anti-slavery discourses hence highlight some of the inherent ironies of a system that invoke, invokes ideologies of paternalism and racial closeness under a brutal and exploitative regime of bondage. This picture of a civil war envelope mocks members of the so-called cotton states aristocracy for feeding at the breasts of black women. And nor were these ironies lost on Harriet Jacobs, who sought in her autobiography to appeal to, quote, respectable women of the northern states through promoting shared ideologies on black and white women's similar strengths and virtues as mothers. Harriet's grandmother had been a wet nurse, and the reality of her everyday life forced, like many other enslaved women, to labour as a wet nurse in addition to all her other tasks was terribly arduous. Moreover, her white owners forced her to wean her own infant, who was Harriet's mother, at a very young age to prioritise the health of her white charge. So other than that of personal choice, there existed other specific circumstances where white women used slave wet nurses. These included a belief among white women that they were unable to feed their children, mostly because they thought their milk supply was too low. And in more extreme cases, physical or mental illness or the death of a mother often resulted in the use of an enslaved wet nurse. This is simply to ensure a child's survival, whether black or white. But whereas slaveholders fought for the survival of their own offspring because of their love they felt for them, when it came to their enslaved children, of course, these people have financial value as commodities. WPA respondent Jeff Calhoun explained how his mother suckled all 15 of his master's children because his wife was known to give milk. And Henry Lewis Gaffney's owners permitted him to feed at his own mother's breast so long as she made the other one available to their white daughter, Miss Amelia. Something was the matter with my mistress and she couldn't nurse her baby, he said. White women often shared their concerns about their milk supplies in their correspondence and diaries. And unlike many enslaved women, they could resort to a wet nurse if they found feeding difficult. Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas described in some detail how she made use of various slave wet nurses, including America, Georgiana, Emily and Nancy. America had lost a baby at just three weeks old after which time she became Ella's wet nurse. Ella believed she had insufficient milk and had already tried be feeding her baby cow and goat's milk. While it's easy to sympathise with Ella and her worries about providing enough milk for her infants, she's incredibly lucky to have so many women available to feed her children what she termed agreeable milk. But of course her lack of empathy is chilling. Ella made no reference to any feelings of compassion towards her father's slave, America, who had recently lost her infant, because such emotions are simply beyond her comprehension. She felt lucky because a female slave's child had died and she failed to recognize America as a fellow woman. 
White slaveholders also made use of enslaved white nurses when an infant's mother, whether a black slave or a white mistress, had died. And in these cases, of course, compassion is obviously important because people want infants to survive. But slaveholders have the added incentive of wanting their baby slaves to survive into adulthood as valuable human beings. So sometimes enslaved children fed at the breasts of black mothers who are not their own, while occasionally too, white women sometimes wet nursed black slave children. Interviewed by the WPA, Mary Reynolds shared her mother's breast milk with her master's daughter following the death of his wife. And enslaved in Georgia, William Water did not shy away from explaining the violent context behind enslaved wet nursing following the death of a white mistress. My Aunt Mary belonged to Master John Craddock and when his wife died and left a little baby, that was Miss Lucy, Aunt Mary was nursing a new baby of her own. So Master John made her let his baby suck too. If Aunt Mary was feeding her own baby and Miss Lucy started crying, Master John would snatch her baby up by the legs and spank him and tell Aunt Mary to go and nurse his baby first. Aunt Mary couldn't answer him a word, but Ma said she often saw Aunt Mary cry till the tears met under her chin. Mary's tears of anguish poignantly convey the sheer desperation of enslaved work, nurse, work nurses, simply trapped in situations where their own children's needs came secondary to those of whites, whether their owners or not. Work nursing also remains a bitterly complex practice because without it, of course, babies would die. More unusually, WPA respondent Charlie Davenport stressed a sense of camaraderie among enslaved women who rallied together to support infant children and practice forms of shared public mothering. This evidence rarely survives. It's something that simply happens without anyone providing a written record. But Davenport said he was breastfed by a variety of enslaved women with young infants after his own mother had died. These women rallied together, practicing these forms of shared mothering in their desire to help Charlie. So white women, as well as black, sometimes work nursed infants, and their reasons for doing so were very complicated. Some WPA respondents spoke to informal networks of support among black and white lactating women more generally, including Clayton Colbert, who said, my mother used to be a cook, and when she was busy cooking, my mistress would nurse both me and her baby, who was four weeks older than me. If it happened, the other was around, my mother would nurse both of us. They didn't think anything about it. But existing alongside this evidence of black and white women's mutual networks of support is testimony that conveys a more exploitative angle of white women's wet nursing. Many WPA respondents recalled slaveholders forcing female slaves to wean their babies early so they could return to their labours elsewhere. And sometimes white mistresses then adopted the role of wet nurse themselves. Eva Martin recalled that while enslaved in Louisiana, Slave infants were nursed at her mistress's breast so that enslaved women didn't lose any time out of the field. Similarly, Bessie Lawson's white mistress wet nursed her as a sickly infant. She explained how her mother was needed to work the crop and the crop assumed priority. So wet nursing, even when undertaken by white women, shows how slaveholders prioritised their female slaves' dual roles of workers and reproducers at different points in time. Once women had served their purpose as reproducers, they could be put back into field work to maximise profits, while another lactating woman, whether white or black, fed her infant child. White women undoubtedly suffered from patriarchal power, I'm not denying that, in that their husbands sometimes forced or otherwise cajoled them to breastfeed slave children. However, I think that white women's victimhood pales into insignificance when compared to that of enslaved women. As co-masters of the slaveholding regime, white women are also aware, of course, of how they, as lactating mothers, could help foster their family's future wealth through wet nursing. Moreover, for some white women suffering an excess of breast milk, the ability to offload milk from leaking, painful or swollen breasts to needy slave, enslaved infants could provide welcome relief. Mary Jones Mallard of Georgia apparently had to wet nurse one of her slaves due to what she called an abundance of nourishment. And there could have been another reason too why white women chose to wet nurse enslaved infants. 
Although scientific, scientific explanations about breastfeeding's role in suppressing fertility remained fairly unclear at this time, some women might have believed that prolonged breastfeeding diminished their chances of getting pregnant. In contrast, their enslaved women, no longer lactating, back in the field, had more chance of falling pregnant and bearing yet more valuable slave children. So, to wrap up, bottles had mostly replaced wet nursing in the United States by the early 20th century. Although so-called professional wet nursing, defined as women formally employed in this role, continued until the 1930s, where wet nurses were often based in hospitals. In the modern world, practices whereby women share breast milk vary widely, influenced by tradition, custom, cultural and religious patterns of belief. Some hospitals continue to house milk banks where women can deposit their breast milk for babies whose mothers are unable to breastfeed or for premature babies. And the World Health Organization recommends breast milk from milk banks for premature babies when the mother's milk is not available. Modern scientific research suggests wet nursing presents some advantages, but also some dangers to nurses and infant children. The benefits include optimum nutrition, digestibility, the passing on of immunities. But there are risks as well, including the transmission of infections caused by viruses and bacteria. Wet nurses feeding their own infants in addition to another could also struggle to produce enough milk while mothers who give their babies to wet nurses miss out on the benefits of breastfeeding, including the production of hormones such as prolactin and oxytocin, both of which allegedly relax mother and child. In 2010, Laleshnik International published new and stringent guidelines about wet nursing for infants only when mother's milk was unavailable. It also advises against informal milk sharing in favour of donated milk from licensed banks. So the medical establishment remains very wary of wet nursing, ostensibly because of the health risks it brings, but maybe also because of the practice's very contentious history in terms of women's relative power, race and class. In his recent book on the visual cultures of slavery, Black Milk, Marcus Wood describes the controversies surrounding this 1989 Benetton advertisement. While some saw the image in terms of positive, strong black womanhood, others regarded this through a prism of racial exploitation that objectifies black women, notably headless in this case. And in 2009, the Mexican-American actor Salma Hayek caused the media furore when she breastfed an infant on a visit to Sierra Leone. According to ABC News, who took this picture, the mother of the baby was unable to feed her own child. This is, of course, an interesting reversal of the slavery dynamic. Wet nursing's history has relevance to the present because patterns of ethnicity and social class still influence breastfeeding pattern patterns, as this chart from the United States shows, but this is also true in the UK as well. Every woman has the right to choose whether or not to breastfeed her own infants, but this important choice, we have to remember, has been denied to some women in the past. And in the realm of infant feeding, the ramifications of race and class still hold resonance today. I think this is the most important legacy of wet nursing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emily. Um, I, I'm very interested in the way that this, uh, this particular project intersects with your earlier work, which, as I understand it, is often about some intimacy um, yeah. and emotion, um, and the difficulties, the methodological difficulties of, of grappling with some of those more abstract um, experiences uh, and, and, and sentiments. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, whether you've managed to unpack the, 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 the emotional sort of ramifications of this, of these both close but also somehow separate um, interracial sort of yeah. experiences. I mean, I think, um, especially from the WPA evidence, we do occasionally get the sense of emotions, such, such as you know, Mary Jones's mother with you and the, the tears running down her face. I mean, I think I always seem to be drawn to history where there are very few sources. <laughs> um, 
I don't, I have no idea why. But it's always been the case. But you know, th thinking in terms of the fact that this is Women's History Month, you know, I, I do feel, I do feel quite strongly actually that it's so important we're not frightened of history where there are a few sources. I think it's important that we're brave enough to tackle difficult history, to really try and get to grips with these people for whom you know, conventional sources don't survive. And it's a contentious point, but I really am a fan of um, sadly, the late Stephanie Camp's assertion that when we don't have evidence, we can speculate, we can imagine, you know. And sometimes if I'm giving talks to history audiences, there's a sort of ruffle of dis <laughs> disapproval in the room about this. And <laughs> American studies can sometimes be a bit more un understanding, but I think it's a, a really important point. You know, we have to put ourselves in the position of these women in the past. And when we're talking about, you know, when I was talking about how women might have resisted wet nursing, I have no evidence for that. You know, so I was, I was literally typing, thinking, what would a woman do in this situation? How would a white woman force an enslaved woman to wet nurse? And what opportunities would that woman have had not to engage in this practice? And from the research I've done, yeah, there's very little evidence of that. But we can speculate, we can imagine. Especially because we know about all the other ways that, that enslaved men and women were used to um, silently and sort of implicitly um, yeah. resist their bondage, absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I think um, that this, um, it, it can be so much more rewarding uh, where, rather than thinking about in abstract terms like one fifth of, 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 of white slave women are using a white nurse. That means far, far less um, than, say, an individual case study that. Yields this sort of this 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 richness of emotional data, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm slightly loath to ask this question because it is women's history month, um, but I was wondering about the impact um, of of this dynamic uh, both on black men, but uh, in enslaved men and on um, the white slave body men as well. Um, whether it impacts how they uh, perceive their own fatherhood, um, the, the fact that enslaved men do not have the same legal um, or sort of, um, practical sort. Of Power over, over over their wives and over their wives' um, labour um, and, and reproductive power as, mm -hmm. as as they would in freedom, uh, and whether um, whether whether white men are too, too squeamish to, to write about this in, in, in British sources, um, wh whether they ha have a negative or positive uh, happiness with their yeah. wives or farming out this work. I think um, I think white men possibly are too squeamish to write about these types of issues. So yeah, m most of the testimony, especially from a white perspective, does come from women. And it tends to be mothers talking to daughters, you know, perhaps sharing more. Mothers talking to other mothers, sharing those things that maybe you don't talk about to people who aren't mothers. But certainly, um, white men have at their disposal a variety of women who can feed infants. You know, and I think you know they, they prefer their infants to be fed by enslaved women. But if they're prioritising their enslaved women's labour as workers, then as I said, you know, white women do suffer from this sort of patriarchal power in that you know they, they will be cajoled or otherwise persuaded into serving as wet nurses themselves. So white men are in the win-win situation here. I haven't found a lot of evidence about what enslaved men felt about their wives as wet nurses. But what I did find, and perhaps this is unsurprising because it was WPA evidence, mostly you know, where the people are children as, um, when they're enslaved, a sort of a glorification of their mothers in a sort of in a typical sort of self-sacrificial way by the by the respondents. But I think sort of in the testimony I've looked at, which is sort of from a slave perspective, sort of published autobiographies and WPA, I haven't been able to sort of to capture, if you like, what enslaved men felt about their wives being white nurses. But I, I guess it sort of fits in with that whole spectrum of you know en enslaved men being sort of angry and frustrated that they can't protect. Their wives from from the horrors of slavery, really, and this is one of them. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have another question, and um, then I'll uh, open it up to the to the rest of the floor, um, which presumably is going to be answered will probably be hampered again by the scarcity of sources. It's handy, well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering whether you'd um, 
if you can pick out any sort of um, regional trends or trends according to the size of the plantation, uh, the crop that's grown on the plantation, which might sort of prioritise um, whether the slaveholder is concerned with um, the sort of reproductive labour or the, the sort of manual labour of these um, enslaved women. Uh, but whether, and whether there's a sort of urban dimension to this, you mentioned yeah. the northern urban situation, uh, but whether the, the, sort of the, the, the slightly more limited urban slavery in the south, whether, whether you get instances of um, yeah. whether it's solely something that's um, seen as something that, that is done by, by black women in the south, or whether there are more white women involved in this um, in, yeah. in, in southern cities. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I, I think, and I'm hypothesising at the moment because this is sort of research that um, my student Rosie's yet, yet to undertake as, as part of her PhD project, but I think most of the advertisement for web, advertisements in southern newspapers for wet nurses tend to come from urban areas. And I think here there's a, a wider pool of wet nurses, including poorer white women who will sell their services as, um, as wet nurses. The advertisements, they're not always for people who want white nurses. You also get women, white and black, who advertise themselves, you know, as lactating women who have the milk they want to sell. So I think that, I think you're absolutely right, I think that would be more pronounced in urban areas. As for other regional differences, I mean, yeah, it's, it's an excuse in a way, but the, the evidence at the moment is so scant that I'm not getting a sense of, for example, different patterns, say, in the South Carolina or Georgia low country where there tends to be a task system. I thought that that might, um, find, I might find regional differences there, but I haven't. I haven't found differences related to crop. But what I have found, and this is interesting, that a lot of the, um, the Texan WPA interviews, you know, a lot of them are in the supplementary series where the interviews are longer, and this is where I found a lot of evidence about wet nurses here. And it's on these very large Texan plantations that you get reference to these institution, institutional style nurseries where you know some, some women would simply be um, employed purely as a wet nurse. Because being employed in this role keeps them lactating, keeps them producing milk you know, over a, mu a much more sort of long run time frame. And this is where I found you know, sort of examples of women who are sort of more formally used in this role by slaveholders on, in Texas, more, more so than elsewhere, but partly because that's, a, of the, that's to do with the size of the plantations, I think. That's really interesting because it seems to sort of look, I, I find often in the literature that, that division between house slave and field slave is quite sort of artificially mm. demarcated, and it seems that the wet nurse role often sort of blurs that boundary, but maybe in that sort of Texan situation, not so much that there is quite a, a yeah. defined role that you occupy for sex. Yeah, time. yeah, certainly it seems to be the case there, but I, I think I, I also agree with you that um, in a way the, the role of wet nurse blurs the boundaries between house and field because you might have a woman who labours in the field, for example, in the day, but then at night she's brought into the so-called big house because she's at late at lactating to feed the white children so the, the white mistress can rest, can sleep at night and recover. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the floor then? Uh, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have another question about kind of reaction to this. Um, seeing as it's quite an intimate relationship, with black women breastfeeding white children and an occasionally mentioned like vice versa. Mm. I'm wondering what commentators, whether in the South or the North, thought about this in terms of the developing kind of racial science in the 1840s and 50s that really wanted to separate out the races. Mm. Uh, and whether you think that if they were commentating about this, they were thinking about it in a similar way to miscegenation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly, um, the evidence I've found so far is that um, within southern developments in southern medicine, they tend to reject the idea that wet nursing will almost be seen as sort of you know this sort of intimate sharing of bodily fluids and something that's something that should be frowned upon. And I think partly because that's because people really want wet nurses, so people create the argument around around what they want. So, so there, I think it was the example from the South Carolina physician, so I can't remember his name, who sort of says that this is simply superstition, you know, that um, wet nursing doesn't imbue people with the, the racial characteristics of the mother who feeds them. But, and I haven't done enough research in the North, and that, that's probably going to be the next stage of the project. I think sort of in, in the North it is becoming um, more common to accept this, you know, that sort of it can be seen 
I like the way you're framing it in terms of almost almost like miscegenation. You know, and I think it is more more seen in this way and undesirable. But in the north, it, it isn't just about race; it's also about social class as well. You know, and because wet nurses have tended in all types of different societies to be of a lower social class, the idea that this is um, this is inherently undesirable is is certainly becoming more popular. Okay. Yeah, um, I was just thinking about another example of where the uh, roles of slave women as reproducers and workers intersect, and mm -hmm. one that I think is more often reimagined now in contemporary literature of coerced pregnancy. And I was wondering if that's something you were looking at and how that kind of intersects with the role of wet nurse and how it differs, and maybe you can say a bit more about that, please. Do you mean um, coerced pregnancies through white men? No, I or, mean in or, terms of like reproducing the workforce. So oh, uh, so this sort of slave, slave breeding. Yeah. Yeah. There are examples um, within WPA testimony of women who say that their owners tried to force them to pair up with an enslaved man who they really, really didn't like. And they, it, they're, they're sad stories, really, because what, what you tend to get is that over the long run, you know, they, they simply accept the fact that they're in a relationship. Um, again, these come from Texas, where you've got the, the longer WPA interviews. Well, I think, is it, is it Rose, might be Rose Williams? I don't know if anyone else is familiar with this case, but she talks about how, um, I think, that the, her husband is called Rufus, and, you know, their master decrees that they've got to stay together. She's really, really unhappy, and she says, you know, sort of, I let him have his way with me. That's as, as strong as she frames it. Um, but then she ends up staying with him through slavery, and it's only after emancipation that she, um, I want to say does one, but <laughs> in more intellectual terms, she, she, she flees the marriage afterwards because she doesn't want to stay with him. But the, these sorts of examples are fairly few and far between. And I, I probably think it's not that common because what I think is it's far easier for owners, um, this is going back to some of my previous research, it's far easier for owners to permit their enslaved people to have Saturday nights off, to go to their frolics, to dances, to meet and court and to marry someone of their own choosing and then to bear children that way. So it's, it's, it's a system that works for, works for masters as well as for enslaved people. It's a much from a white perspective, it's much harder to try and enforce enslaved women into these types of relationships, but there is some evidence of this. Um, I was just wondering, um, does this reveal something about the mobility of enslaved women um, versus enslaved men in this time? Okay. This idea that because women were both workers and reproducers, they have a dual role, and I wonder, does that reveal something in the amount that they're logged out to the neighbouring plantations and perhaps does that does your research contribute in that way as well to yeah. the story? I think that um, when I first started this project I thought that it would be really interesting to look at slaves who are hired out and I thought it would be quite common that people would hire um, lactating slaves to others um, when I started looking through the secondary literature on slave hiring, and I think when you do things like wet nursing, it's never in an index. It's <laughs> 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 so frustrating, and so I had to do lots of reading, and I, I found that it was really, really neglected. Um, I have found through sort of my, my own research, I found a couple of examples of slaveholders wanting to hire. Um, an enslaved woman who was lactating, but that, that kind of fits in with this whole sort of uh, advertisements thing. They, t they tend to advertise the slaves to hire rather than to um, rather, rather than to, to buy or just simply sort of use their services as pay for their services as white nurses. I think I think more broadly, sadly, this speaks to a very lack of mobility for enslaved women because they're they're trapped in the fields and they're trapped in the big house. And a, sort of a broader literature on enslaved mobility has shown that sort of when men have opportunities, not that slavery is a meritocracy, but when men have opportunities to sort of be promoted to positions of relative power or authority, these tend to be roles that take them away from plantations and farms. 
you know, sort of carriage drivers, traders, that even sort of hunting and fishing at weekends, which they might do informally. Men seem to live in a, a wider world than women. And so I, I think that this is another way in that the dual exploitation of enslaved women really ties them to their homes. There's also a body of literature that suggests that um, sort of willful mobility as well as escaping is something that's far more open to enslaved men than enslaved women as well, potentially because of the emotional labour that they're um, yeah. performing as well as women. Yeah, and it's um, I kind of intrinsically I I never liked that literature because I always thought well this is really unfair on men because why you know it's almost like saying that men don't care for their children don't love their children men are more likely to flee whereas it's only women who who want to stay for their children. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. I think it might be the parents' stay. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's men who haven't had children who flee more than women. Um, I found one case, I don't think I mentioned it today, but there was one case in the WPA narratives of um, an enslaved woman who practiced um, you know, absentees, absenteeism, you know, where she hid out in the woods, and then she was coming back to, um, back to breastfeed her infant. So yeah, that's a really practical example of, of how, how feeding does tie women to certain places. Can we talk about um, what I've seen in the black populations in presumably the really urban populations? I don't know if you've done any work on that, whether there are some similarities or whether it's a sort of system in operation. I found I haven't found any evidence of free, free black wet nursing in, in the world. Free, free black people don't need any resources anyway. I know. You know, so it's, it's a, when, when I wrote that book in 2012, you know, I was, I was using sort of petitions mm. that they submitted to state legislators, uh, and that, that wasn't ever about feed, infant feeding. You know, so yeah, it's, it's such a sort of private and personal thing that it, it's really hard to get to. But I, I suspect, and again, this is where probably the um, sort of advertisements are going to be interesting. I suspect that you know, sort of within urban centres, just as you have free white women advertising their services as wet nurses, you'd have poor black women advertising their services as well. And whether you do get the sort of trapping of these sort of ideas about race over times, whether on balance white people would have preferred white wet nurses if they were there, that that would be quite interesting. I think if we can track it if we can find out any more about it. Um, yeah, this isn't a question, it's a suggestion, it's maybe a moment at all, but no, no, I wonder if you've heard of Cecilia Settle Egypt. Um, she was um, a sociologist, an African-American yeah. sociologist, yeah. Uh, and she actually recorded um, survivors of slavery. So I don't know if there's anything in her recordings, but she, yeah. I think, most of what she recorded was published by Charles S. Johnson, probably, probably under his name, so her mm -hmm. own recording okay. may be lost within that, but it might be an alternative to the WK narrative, mm -hmm. uh, and especially this course, most of those were in white, white men, so yeah. Yeah, of course it would be better yeah. no, so it's going to be No, thank you, thank you. That's, that's really helpful because we're, you know, we're clutching at straws or needles in haystacks or whatever analogy you want to use to look, look, look for evidence here, so yeah, that's really helpful. It predates yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, thanks. Yeah, I was wondering if you could say something about your broader comparative project and the minds that might have grown on differing kinds of things. Yeah, um, the, the broad, broader project, we, we have um, an NHRC network grant, which is which is great when you're getting sort of projects off the ground, you know, sort of just to sort of literally to, to network and you know, hold, hold events with, with other people. It's, um, we framed it in terms of motherhood more broadly, um, rather than thinking about infant feeding more specifically, simply because we're so worried about evidence. So we're, we're starting off sort of ne necessarily broad. Um, certainly, um, Camelia Cowling, who's based in Warwick, certainly sort of her research suggests that, um, and there's Maria Helene Mach Machado as well in Sao Paulo, Certainly, both of their research suggests that wet nursing is very common um, in Brazil, 
that women do sacrifice the health of their own children. But a lot of this research, again, it's at a sort of kind of, sort of micro level, looking at one or two individual cases. Um, interestingly, I was talking at, at the beginning of the talk today, um, it became really fashionable in Brazil, apparently, to have your photograph taken. Um, the white families had their photos, the white families had their photograph taken with their wet nurse because um, slavery survives through into 1888 in Brazil, and so developments in photography means there's quite an extens extensive bank of um, images which we're actually hoping to put together an exhibition of for one of our events. Caribbean's somewhat different, of course, because you've got a sort of tradition of um, absentee owners, smaller islands, so it's a sort of very different um, practices, really, and I think really the only sort of substantial research here has been that of um, Sarah Franklin, as I said, who's worked on, um, she's got a chapter in her book on slavery in Cuba, in which she, she looks at white nurses. I think, to me, she, she frames, and she's coming to one of our events, so I need to be careful, but, but to me, she, she frames it a little bit too positively about white nursing as offering opportunities for enslaved women, as it's a way of acquiring status and prestige um, in the eyes of whites. Um, which I haven't found at all from the US evidence. So it'd be interesting to see how, how that develops. Um, I'm just really interested in some work on white nursing in the 18th century. This one. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I'm sorry for my very scant and brief <laughs> summary of that. But um, the, I was going to ask you about the teacher's question because that feels different somehow. That because I was interested in that idea that they were giving birth at, at the same time because the kind of contracting it looked more like it was okay, you have lots of children as an aristocratic woman and you've got to provide your care of them. Yeah. Um, but it, in return for performing the job, it's going to be more often. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you get different types of evidence here, don't you? And certainly I think sort of in, in one of the cases, one of the extracts I put up on the side, it seemed to be the case that, um, you know, the sort of the slaveholding couple, you know, they'd got together and they'd married. And then it just seemed to be the case that, you know, they were, you know, I guess either without contraception, they're roughly producing a child every couple of years. Yeah. And then so was her enslaved woman. So that's, <coughs> that's very convenient for the white family because it means that her slave is always lactating roughly the same time that she gives birth. So she's always got the woman there to use as a wet nurse. But then the other side of the coin, of course, is that this, is this manipulated by white women, you know, especially where white women are wet nurses themselves? Do they, you know, do they partake in wet nursing these other children so that they hope they won't get pregnant themselves? And how would they want those nurses to work to feed their children at all? Certainly, um, just trying to sort of a bit of quantification. Certainly, I think it seems it seems as though it's at least a year that that white children would be fed. Conversely, it, it, evidence commonly suggests that enslaved infants are weaned sometimes as young as three months old. Which again, that goes against sort of current current advice, which is um, about the weaning at six months old. So three months does seem very young, especially bearing in mind you know, what they'd be weaned onto, which might be sort of you know bits of um, sort of bread boiled in water or uh, sort of other dangerous things. It's also because I was interested in what you're saying about the uh, the abolitionists taking up taking up this as well. Mm. And is that it, so? There's like, there's some response to that is to, is to say sort of I think the defence really comes after the Civil War with this um, lost cause ideology, you know, that sort of um, harks back to the days of slavery in a sort of very romanticised way, laments the loss of slavery. And I think that then you get um, all this discourse, all this literature about wet nursing, all, you know, almost as, as a way of um, emphasising racial closeness in the South. So I, I think. You know, there's a, there's a, a, t a time lag here, really. And sort of, you know, in the 1850s, 
in fairly close to the civil war, it's, it's used by abolitionists as this sort of form of propaganda, but then it's used as a form of propaganda in different ways by, um, by lost cause apologists. Um, um, yeah, it's just a small question. Um, I was just interested in where exactly Bryce and Jamal's translation would take place, because a lot of the sources seem to imply that it would be in the houses, mm -hmm. so when they were um, witnesses. Um, but was that something that it would be very much sort of in a private room away from other people, and did that change depending on whether enslaved women were wet nursing mm -hmm. white women's children or whether she was nursing her own children? I think um, when enslaved women when white slaveholders use enslaved women as wet nurses, they take the, the wet nurses into their big house. Um, maybe not all the time, maybe just at night, but then they'd be, they'd typically, I think they'd typically, they'd be in the same room as, as their white mistress, perhaps, you know, on a sort of, you know, a, perhaps hypothesizing again, perhaps, you know, sort of on a sort of makeshift bed at the, at the end of the room, and, the, and they'd be wet nursing then. Um, or possibly they might be in a room with the, Infants, if the mistress wants to go off and get her good night's sleep, she'd, she'd go out <coughs> there and, and she'd leave her baby with the enslaved woman. So I think this is something that takes place really, um, really in the big house. There's, there's one example as well, um, I don't think I, I mentioned it today, where um, one white woman who had, she has lots of visitors to her house, you know, and, and she, want, you know, she wants the host, she want, but she, and she doesn't want to breastfeed in front of people, you know, so if people felt embarrassed, you know, about, about getting their breasts out, about feeding, then, you know, sort of giving your infant away to a wet nurse. Again, it's, it's this, this fact of convenience and choice that's so important, because white women have the ability to make these choices, you know, I don't want to feed, or I feel I can't feed, or I genuinely can't feed, you know, it's again, it's a whole sort of spectrum of decisions that these, these women make about feeding. Um, I had a, a complicated question from what you're asking. So I've got my I've got my pen. <laughs> um, one of the slides you um, there's a quote and it said something on the line she was a good Christian woman and she got the children to pray. Um, I was wondering what role religion seems to play in this process, whether that's in the heart of um, this being a kind of good Christian duty that kind of fits in those ways that are understood in those ways. And um, you know, there's also now more work emerging on religion and kind of slavery and slave slave process and even from the South. I mean, does this filter in very much at all into that what you found? Um, I, th I think more broadly, um, <coughs> religion is used as um, a tool to promote sort of good modern motherhood, you know, good modern Christian mothers, I think, you know, can feed their own children, I think, sort of, you know, in America more broadly, it's sort of, it's seen, it's seen as sort of um, necessary and desirable that women feed their own children, so I think some religion, some religious feelings would, would, would come into that, that this is what, what women are meant to do. Um, I think that the slide of where one of the respondents is talking about is his own mother. I think that's part of this sort of romanticization that some of the male respondents have about their own enslaved mothers. So he, he wants to say how virtuous, pious, noble, and self sacrificial and fantastic his own mother is. So that's why he, he mentions her, her Christianity there. Um, but I don't know a lot more about that but certainly it, it's it's something that crops up so i think i should quote it in more depth and perhaps draw it out more explicitly as a theme there so i have a final question then perhaps to, to wrap up which is to do with the sort of sexualization mm -hmm. or asexualization of, of, of a female slave and you mentioned those two um sort of overarching stereotypes with jezebel um, mm -hmm. and the mammy um the mammy being Asexual and devoted to um, her white family, um, and the Jezebel being a, a really useful stereotype for white women to excuse the behaviour of, yeah. of, of, of white men towards towards black the sort of sexual abuse of, of black women. Um, I was wondering if you see any sort of uh, because the, the, the wetness seems to occupy a sort of strange sort of dichotomy there. She's 
and sexual imagery is fertile um, by, by yeah. necessity, um, but equally has lots of, uh, needs to be asexual in order not to affect the normal other to affect the wider wider Yeah, yeah, exactly, which is, which is an irony, I think, <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, so uh, I think simply sort of, I was concerned with what I was reading um, with mostly a lost cause, but it's also, you also see it in early historiography as well, where people simply do conflate mammy and wet nurse. And yeah, it's to me that it, you know, my concerns were like yours, like, well, these two can't be the same, because if we buy into this mammy stereotype, you know, that she never married, she's virginal, asexual, she's utterly devoted to her, her wife family, then she can't be a wet nurse. So I, it, I think really sort of what, I, what I'm seeking to do here is really just to, you know, to, I know people have broken down the stereotype already, but maybe to break it down in a, in a different way, in a new way, and expose some of the complexities of Manny. And also to think, well, actually, sort of, if Manny's also um, a wife and a mother, that really speaks to how awful and how difficult and how hard, hard her life is because she's expected to play this <coughs> one role in the white household but then she's also got her, her own family to care for as well so yeah i think really sort of questioning the relationship between the two they might be the same but but they're not always the same and there are important differences there thanks very much indeed i thank you for joining me and thank you for a great talk <laughs>